I, I asked the class once, um, how many of you read through the Bible? And one student said, the whole thing? <laughs> so I said, yes. You know, and, and, and that really pushed me so that I, I make it an assignment with my classes. They have to buy a one-year Bible. Comes in all translations, all sizes. This is just the, the newest edition I had. And it takes you from January the 1st to December 31st. Oh with the sections from the First Testament, and, and I learned that at New York Theological Seminary in my 13 years there, they never said Old Testament. They always said First Testament. And then the uh, Second Testament was not called New. It was called Second Testament. So that people wouldn't get this sense that when something's old, you want to discard it. You think that it's finished. You know, that time, that's past. But even Jesus said, I come not to destroy. I come not to, to throw it away. I come to fulfill it. Okay? So to know that the one-year Bible, you, I mean, start reading. If you're a slow reader, it'll take you maybe 45 minutes. If you're a fast reader, I know sometimes the First Testament passages can be long. And you start reading some of the things you don't want to read, you know, that is about so-and-so begat so-and-so and so-and-so, and so -and -so, you know, um, slept with the fathers. And so, you know, who, who, you know, who wants to read all that? But it's, it's in the scripture for a reason. It reminds us, from dust you come, to dust you shall return, and teaches us to number our days. It does not matter. You can hold on to this if you want to look at it. Okay, but the one-year Bible, and it comes in compact. I've had the compact one. Uh, I've had the Living Bible translation. I've had, uh, you know, different, you know, um, styles. So they have a pocket size, the bigger size, um, leather. You can, you know, they have all kinds. One for women, for men. You know, they all kinds. So you can choose what you want. This one is good because it has spaces on the side where you can have notes. And I used to, you know, people teach you, don't write in your Bible. So, um, but this one lets you write in it. So, uh, but I, I'm so used to people telling me not to write in my Bible that I was trying not to, but then I said, forget it. And I started writing on the side because, and I, I wanna link this. When you are reading your Bible on a daily basis, then also have alongside your Bible And um, I need to show you an example. Now, this is one, and this is another. So, when I am reading scripture, I write in the margins, but I also have books that help me with notes for sermons. Okay, because you, when you, uh, trust me, I had students who said, I never get a preaching engagement. And I look at them and I said, well, have you prepared a sermon? Amen. I, I said, I dare you. Start writing a sermon every week as if you were going to preach on Sunday. And if you got a word from the Lord, the Lord opened the door for you to preach it. Now, some of the greatest reformers, they took to the streets. John Wesley was soapbox preacher. He would get up 2, 3 a.m. in the morning. By 4 and 5, he was standing where the people would travel on their way to work, preaching the word. Are you that dedicated that you'll preach the word wherever God sends you? That's the question. Because people want to hear, but do you want to do if you want to preach, read the word, take down your thoughts, write it down, come back to it, because they are seed thoughts for your sermons. The same thing with illustrations. So much happens. I, I use the illustration I was teaching in um, our prep school, and I made a commitment to God. I said, now, if we start this school, then I want to teach religion to the children. 
And um, it was one little guy. I was teaching them about prayer, and I wanted them to draw an illustration, and then they would write a prayer under it. So he's busy. I'd done my presentation on prayer and what prayer means. It's communicating with God and how God wants to talk to us. doesn't matter how long. Uh, you just Your heart is just open. And this little fellow, this a second grader, he's coloring, drawing his picture, and he said, Reverend Barbara. And I said, yes, keep a prayer in your heart. <laughs> and that's what I, you know, I had to write it down because he was giving me a cue. He saw something in his drawing of the picture, and he said to me, keep a prayer in your heart. He didn't know what I was going through that day, but he, he cut something off at the pass that I could pray about it and not act on it, all right? Um, to know that children, for me, are the greatest source of inspiration because they're pure, and they're going to say what they think. You have to train and educate them. But if as a child, the importance, we used to say, learn it by heart. Nothing bothers me today worse than seeing children come up and they have to read from a piece of paper. No, they have them do the plays and all this. and they read. I said, if you bring another child up here reading off that paper, they can remember. Take time. Teach them. Let them get it in their heads. Because that was the importance of education for us. When you get into a hard time, if you don't have scripture in your heart, you may not be able to pull out a Bible. Oh my God, my God, my God. But you can bring up that word that's in your heart, and you can say that scripture. If somebody were, to, and I've been in the situation, if they ask you how to, that you have to preach, at a drop of head, if I say, come up here and give me a sermon on, on such and such and so on, some people would freeze. They wouldn't be able to do it. But you ought to be able to examine something and to understand what it's calling forth. Not that you would know all the exegetical moves. You may not. But you can give. There's more, you know, different ways in which it is not just the sermonette I'm talking about. Sometimes it's just the word of exhortation a word of encouragement. Sometimes it's a word of correction. Sometimes it's a teaching moment. And God gives you a word to say to a person or to a group of people. And you have to be ready and comfortable to do that. Sometimes it's your testimony. Yep. And if the truth be told, many of us are preaching is simply our testimony. Why do you say that? Because we don't take a text. Now, that's another, that's a pet peeve of mine. If you're going to preach. So some of you say, like, well, that means you're a biblical preacher, you're an expository preacher. I said, I don't care what style you use. Just use the word. And be prayerful. Because the other thing we can do in our preaching is create a canon within the canon. How many books are in the Bible? Okay, that's a canon that was decided in 90 AD in Jamnia. Now, understand this. Some of us will only deal with about four or five books in our preaching. That's the importance of using the one-year Bible and allowing it to become a part of your life because it exposes you to all 66 books. So you're cheating yourself. There are blessings that God wants to get to you. There's a deeper understanding of the word that God wants to present. But if you can't read it, how will you get a deeper understanding? 